When it comes to light gun games, your traditional rail shooters like Time Crisis and House of the Dead aren't the only ones to come out. Capcom wanted to give their own flair and mark on the light gun genre. Thus, in the year 2000, they collaborated with Tosi and made Resident Evil Survivor. Resident Evil Survivor came out on the PlayStation 1 and was actually combining elements of a first person shooter with a light gun as the main controller. This actually makes RE Survivor the actually first entry in the franchise with a first person perspective, which itself paved the way for Resident Evil 7 and 8. You did the same RE things done in the previous games, but in first person, and you could use the gun con to shoot. Except in North America, because, well, Columbine hysteria about violent video games or something, and Capcom bought into it and removed, well, gun con support from the North American version, but PAL and Japanese versions still had it. And combine that with the game's unique structure, the way it handled certain aspects, its shorter length compared to the other RE games around this time, and you have a game that wasn't all that positively received. Despite this, Capcom still didn't give up on the series and put out a sequel in Resident Evil Survivor 2 Code Veronica. Rather than tell an original story like Survivor 1, Survivor 2 took the Survivor formula, made some tweaks to it, and basically retold the story of Code Veronica, the latest mainline entry in the series at the time, in a, well, unique way. Sadly, this entry did not find its way to North America, but the next entry did. This next entry, though, would take place in the other RE-adjacent series Capcom had, Dino Crisis. Dino Crisis already had two successful game under its belt, and the third game was still on the way. In the meantime, Capcom thought this would be a good tie-over. The game was originally announced in spring of 2002 through Capcom's official site under the name Gun Survivor 3 Dino Crisis, not only indicating a new Gun Survivor game, but a Dino Crisis spin-off. Well, I say spin-off, but the story itself actually does kind of give some preambles and partially does sort of like an in-between-ish kind of thing here with Dino Crisis. It's complicated. You'll see soon enough. This is around the time development started according to them, but the details were tight-lipped. The game was scheduled for a June 2002 release in Japan, but North America and PAL territories were left waiting. One month later, Capcom revealed more information in regards to the story, affirming the main character would basically be involved in some sort of time travel and also encounter a character from Dino Crisis 2. Well, actually two, but we'll get to that later. Capcom further showed off the game at that year's E3 2002 under its new international name of Dino Stalker. You think they would give it a more unique name or something. This name not only makes it sound more generic, but it doesn't feel like a Dino Crisis name at a glance unless you recognize the female character. Nor is there any other indication on the box that indicates it's a part of the Dino Crisis universe. I get ditching the Survivor name since, yeah, RE Survivor wasn't well received over here, but give us something. So, a quicker development than expected, a budget bin like title that doesn't even give the smallest of indication of the series it's set in a la Death by Degrees. Boy, did that throw things off? Not necessarily. Dino Stalker, known in Japan as Gun Survivor 3 Dino Crisis, was developed by Tosi, published by Capcom, and was released exclusively on the PS2 on June 27, 2002 for Japan, September 17, 2002 for North America, and three days later for Europe. The Survivor series had a rough outing to start, but going into this one first, not having played any other Dino Crisis, RE Survivor, or most RE games by this point, I'm not sure what I was expecting. But I am a fan of light gun games. I always have been, and I always will be. So when I ended up playing this for the first time, I actually found myself enjoying it quite a bit. Now, this game isn't going to be for everyone, but for those looking for a unique take on a light gun genre that feels a bit more rounded out than RE Survivor by other accounts... Well, it might be it, but there are some things that I do think kind of hold the game back in some regards. Let's check it out. Dino Stalker only really has one mode of play. This isn't that far off from the other RE Survivor games. The game is primarily a first-person shooter mixed with arcade light gun elements. 
The main stage is that the game will have you move around them from point A to point B within the time limit. While getting to point B, you'll shoot down various dinosaurs you encounter. After emptying your clip, you reload like every other light gun game that isn't Time Crisis. It's not too hard to figure out what is where thanks to the in-game map, and it conveniently helps that they point you in the right direction. Once you get to the end of most stages, sans a couple, uh, you'll fight a boss. You'll really need to know how to move around to keep your health intact. So, while this game is linear in nature, you aren't on rails like Time Crisis, at least for... I would say about half-ish of the stages, something like that, though some of the enemies can be a bit much even on easy. To help you out, there are various power-ups you can pick up as you play through the levels, starting with various special weapons. There are three types of shots in this game. Your main rifle, which has infinite ammo, a sniper shot that can be activated by holding A and B on the gun con too, and then there's the special shot. You'll find various other weapons and they will go here. These only have a certain amount of ammo, but you find plenty of them throughout the levels. You've got a machine gun, hand grenades, grenade launcher, rocket and missile launcher, and some oddities like a flame grenade launcher, uh, laser gun, bow gun, flamethrower, plasma gun, spark gun, and a mine thrower. In addition, there are other power-ups. These include extra life points. You can have up to five max on your main health meter. Uh, revive power-ups that bring you back if you run out of health points. Antidotes to deal with poison. Bullet power-ups that basically changes the bullets in your main gun to more powerful ones. And there are these time crystals that when shot or collected, they'll add time. The smaller pink ones add 3 seconds. The bigger blue ones add 30 seconds. Oh, did I mention that the game is on a time limit? Yeah. In the upper right hand corner, you can see a timer running. If time runs out, it's game over and you have to redo the stage. Same if you lose all your health points and don't have a revive power up. I should also mention there aren't mid-level checkpoints. This means you can get to the boss, die or run out of time, and have to redo the whole stage all over again. Not exactly fun, you know. Also, due to the time limit, you're never really given that much time to appreciate the environments let alone doing any of the usual exploration stuff you've done in past RE games, and hell, even Survivor 1 to a certain degree. Now, I know this game took a more arcade-oriented direction, but still, I mean, eh, it is what it is. And you're never really given time to appreciate the environments, unless you unlock Infinity Mode, but more on that later. The whole thing feels like it's a more simplified version of Survivor 2. That game took a lot of the RE elements out of Survivor and dumbed it down into grab key, then escape to area, then boss battle. Well, this game doesn't even have the key collecting thing. It's just follow the pointer while shooting whatever dino is in your way and occasionally getting better weapons and power-ups to survive. While the game isn't too long, length has never really been long for these types of games, the lack of mid-level checkpoints can be frustrating for those who keep struggling on one section especially on a higher difficulty, and those looking for depth may want to look elsewhere, especially to the main franchises of Dino Crisis and Resident Evil. At least the controls help enhance the experience? Well, that depends on how you play it. When playing on actual hardware, you can play with a controller or the Gun Con 2. Once again, the Gun Con 2 is the preferred way to play these sorts of games. You use the Thumb Con to move, A button to strafe left, B button to strength right, C to switch to special shot, which, by the way, when you switch back and forth between them, it can actually reload your main gun, so you can reload without shooting off screen, which is kind of nice. Hold A and B for the sniper shot, and then shoot off screen to reload as one way. And you use the thumb con to also move the uh, reticle, so it's kind of like the sniper missions in the rescue mission mode in Time Crisis 3. Everything is precise, shooting is accurate when properly calibrated, and it's pretty easy to move around, but it does feel a bit clunkier than normal, at least with how I played it in emulation. See, when you map the right controls to where they should be, shooting on mouse and moving on WASD when playing in PCSX2, the game feels so well. And this actually, I would say, is the best way to play it if you can't use a gun con too. I know what you're thinking. What about the Sindan coffee? 
Well, it seems the people who made the Sindon didn't quite take into account that people may have wanted to play this game and the other Survivor games with the Sindon, at least on the PS2. And, yeah. Okay, so I tried to do that, and, well, I felt the Gun Con 2 was better. With the D-pad on the side, moving feels more like a pain, and you need to do that quite a bit here. Also, I think the play space is more affected by this compared to other Gun Con 2 games on Ascendant. Maybe if I had more room it would be better, but I can't say for sure. What I can say is that the button layout for moving, A and B commands, and maybe input delay, because it felt like it for me, really makes the Sindan a bit of a letdown here. The graphics are fine, but they aren't really going to blow your mind. The textures are adequate across the levels, and this also pertains to objects like trees, crates, rocks, and other environmental pieces you can think of. They are modeled decently enough, and they look appealing, more so in PCSX2. There also seems to be little aliasing going on, however, regardless of where you play it, the FMV cutscenes don't really look so great. On real hardware, they look a bit pixelated, which given the quality of other FMVs and other Capcom games from this time, like Resident Evil Code Veronica, this is kind of surprising. Then again, this probably was a budget title in terms of development costs, so I guess it can't be a surprise that it seems like some corners were cut, although they do look a little better in emulation. They at least got the aesthetic down. The game has this sort of futuristic post-apocalyptic vibe going on. This is pretty much in line with the first two Dino Crisis games, which helps it fit in with the others rather nicely. The futuristic vibe mainly shows in the UI. The map, some of the weapons, some environments you encounter later in the game, etc. There's also a decent amount of variety in the environments. Jungles, a river, a cave, and some abandoned city-like areas, and some other places. With the light gun games not having many levels, they really need to make it stand out. Dino Stalker does a decent enough job in this regard, and the game on the whole looks good for the era it's in, though it's not going to push the PS2 to its max limit. The sound design is decent enough. The sound effects consist of a mix of matching sound effects depending on the environments you're in, which match really well for each environment, as well as futuristic sounds as well. The latter comes from the menu, radar, and the voice that calls out when you need to reload, oh excuse me, reload as the game pronounces it, slash switch shot type. The normal guns sound like they should. It's the unique guns, like the plasma, laser, and spark gun that have unique sounds. They sound well, clear, and they just fit the bill. The music itself also fits the environment. It's not quite as good as the main music from the Dino Crisis series, but it fits the bill enough. Although they did, sounds like they did reuse the save room theme from Dino Crisis 2 for a couple of the exposition bits, and, well, that track is a banger. But then again, most of those save room themes are. Anyways, it sounds familiar, it can elicit fear where needed, and it works. Some days, I feel like I can only say so much about a game like this in this regard. The voice acting isn't particularly great. It tends to lean more on the bad side of good bad. Delivery feels awkward, it doesn't come off as intended in some parts, and the audio mixing actually feels off. It's kind of hard to hear what's being said at times since the other sounds slash music tend to overpower the voices. There are no options to adjust the volume either, nor are there any subtitles options at all. Oh well. There are several unlockable modes here. Beating on easy will unlock theater mode so you can view the game's cutscenes. Beating on normal unlocks duo mode. This lets you use a controller for movement and a light gun for shooting at the same time. The real idea though is that you play with a partner and your partner controls one while you control the other. Beating on hard unlocks bonus art and beating on hard three times on one save file unlocks infinity mode, which gives you infinite time and infinite ammo on specials. So you'll spend a bit of time on each difficulty, but what good is this stuff without actually having it? Only one way to get it, let's play this game. We start off in 1943 over the Atlantic Ocean. We see a bunch of World War II dogfighting going on as we're introduced to our main character, Mike Wired. He's doing the usual ordeal, but after he helps out a comrade, he gets shot down out of his plane. He ejects out of his plane, but right as he's about to get shot, this happens.
He gets teleported off into the future of 2009. He's given a rifle and a wristwatch with a timer as a bunch of pteranodons approach him, starting stage 1. You're on rails in this stage. All you control is the direction you face. It's a pretty simple stage that gets you a feel for the game's mechanics, at least the shooting and turning. You'll shoot dinos and parts of your broken plane down. By the end, you take out a bunch of golden ones that approach you, and then stage one is done. Mike then lands and has no idea where he is, but he does know he's in trouble. <laughs> I'm in danger! Stage 2 then begins, and the full weight of the gameplay reveals itself. You'll find yourself shooting through various dinos and trees and whatever as you move throughout the jungle. There are many objects that can be shot here in addition to crates, like trees and rocks. As you continue, you'll move down the river and into a field, then a small canyon, and finally, an open area not far off from the jungle. When Mike gets there, he sees a mysterious girl. Who are you? Tell me, where are we? I was flying over the Atlantic, where there were no islands in sight. Then boom, I'm here! What on earth is going on? Hey, say something, will ya? Trinity. Trinity? Yeah, that doesn't give us too much to go off of. Raptors attack, and we have to clear off as many as the game wants us to. After the raptors, this happens. We fight two Carnotauruses. I should point out that they only have one health bar, which is actually a blessing in disguise. And this is where the game really tends to feel a bit more clunky than it should be. See, many of these bosses tend to be quick with attacks, and that requires you to move fast, but you aren't always able to. Sometimes you get lucky, and other times you don't. But if you're a quick shot and you have enough health power-ups, you can survive most of the bosses. So just dodge the best you can and keep firing away. We beat them, they flee, and Mike then finds a boat on the river and takes it to head off as Stage 3 begins. We go back to the on-rails nature of Stage 1, but we're going down the river instead of flying in the air. Our main enemy here are the Plesiosauruses. It starts off as a simple shooting gallery ride until we get into a canyon of sorts. Pteranodons also return here as the ride starts to speed up a bit. The canyon also starts to fall apart in places, so you need to shoot the rocks as they fall, in addition to the ones in front of some spots for the quite bumpy ride. Uh, things slow down as you enter a cave while fending off more pteranodons. We then reach the end of the stage, and we close it by shooting off more plesiosauruses until the game says we're done. The last one standing falls into a rock, breaking it open and making a makeshift waterfall out of the cave. Mike falls, washes up on shore, and finds himself on a desert stage that is stage 4, including a blatant Planet of the Apes reference. The stage starts with you running through an open desert. There are plenty of these other raptor-like creatures that can steal stuff if you're not careful. At first, you'll have a bunch of room to move around, but as you get closer to the end of the stage, you'll find another canyon. At the end of it, though, there's a portal. With no other choice, a voice on his watch tells him to move. Find Paula. You have to find Paula. Paula? You mean that girl? The clock is ticking. The catastrophe will happen very soon. Quit trying to stall with that stupid excuse. He then finds the girl named Paula and makes his way over. You can shoot more rocks down in this section to clear them, but you still need to be aware of your surroundings and the time limit. Also, the dinosaur bones can be shot. After enough movement, we go to the plane wreckage where Paula is, and guess who shows back up? Yep, it's time for round two of the Carnotauruses. Lather, rinse, and repeat the strategy from the last time you fought them and you win. They run off for the second time, and Mike and Paula introduce themselves. Mike. You know 
know my name? But why? Where are we anyway? You have to tell me. Tell me something. Anything. Yeah, Paula is pretty much the same as she was in Dino Crisis 2. That's why she lets the watch do the talking. We then get a long-ass exposition about why this has unfolded the way it has. An energy source by the name Third Energy accidentally overflows in 2009 and causes dimensional time warps. This caused major environmental and ecological damage during the Dinosaur Age. The damage would alter the timeline by screwing up mankind's creation. Thus, Noah's Ark plan was created and executed. This would send the dinosaurs into the future while work in the environmental system would be done to fix it. Once that was done, the dinos would go back home. However, the trip back home for them was anything but smooth. All personnel except the man telling Mike this were killed. The mother computer then took over the project, but unfortunately it failed and another time warp happened as a result. Dinos were sent to hyperspace. This is where Mike is with them. The man introduces himself as Dylan Morton from Dino Crisis 2, along with his daughter Paula. Mike and Paula find themselves in an abandoned city. Dylan calls in. He warns them about Trinity. We get more exposition explaining not even a minute or so after the last one. The mother computer wanted a lead dino to finish the plan. Thus it created Trinity from the DNA of the Trudon due to high intelligence. Trinity got the power to control all dinos, but mission parameters said to kill anyone standing in their way. Because we've been shooting at the dinos all game, they're trying to kill us. It's then on to stage 5. We commandeer a jeep and we shoot while Paula drives. Once again, we're back to an on-rail shooter. We shoot many dinos as we drive through the Rex city. You'll probably use more antidotes here thanks to the Oviraptor section where they can just shoot poison at you. After that, we run through some kind of base, shooting down barrels that a Triceratops knocks in our way. We then run through some kind of plant area, taking out many more dinos. After that, we cross a bridge, go through some kind of shopping area, as we stop in some kind of circular area, when guess who shows up again? Yeah. Yeah, these bozos make everything worse. I hope you have special bullets and a good weapon special saved, because you can't move at all, nor can you snipe shot. This is the worst incarnation of this boss for that very reason. But it's the last time you fight them. Fend them off and then run because... another chase sequence. This is the closest I'm sure many of us will get to playing the T-Rex chase in the special edition of Sega's Lost World arcade game, because that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Keep firing like crazy here, and have enough health points. They get away but crash because no breaks. We then find ourselves in the base of Trinity. You again? You just won't give up, will you? Wow, this is the first time you've seen Trinity this up close. Like, really close. Uh, and that's beside the point. You're in a closed area for this, but you can move around freely. Trinity often calls on goons to take you out, so watch out for them while getting many power-ups. Keep at it until it goes down. See ya. With Trinity out of the picture, Dylan shows up as a hologram. He then gives us our final task. There's a volcano close by. I want you to go down inside its crater. There you will find the mother computer. Debug and reconstruct the program, returning this timeless only island back to the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago, where it belongs. We also get an explanation of why Mike came here. Intensive resistance from the mother computer can be expected. There was no way Paula would be able to carry out her mission alone. So I calculated and reached the conclusion that I could bring someone from the year 1943 to this porch, utilizing a time slip. There are lots of people living in 1943, you know? In this mission, extreme intelligence and brain are required. Also, most important of all, 
the person has to be on the brink of his final hour when he is transported here. Final hour? I couldn't force someone who still had a long life ahead of him to come here. I couldn't guarantee that he would make it back. So yeah, it seemed random, but now not so much. Still weird as hell though. The roar of the real final beast calls out to us as we make it to the final stage. Surprise, surprise! The motherfucking T-Rex is back for one last battle. This boss doesn't even really feel that special since it pretty much plays out like most of the other bosses anyways. You drain its health the first time, then this happens. the lava, but other than that, it's the same ordeal as before. Send them back to the prehistoric age. With that taken care of, Mike reunites with Paula, the mother computer is fixed, as Mike and Paula have one last goodbye before Mike is sent back to 1943. Everything is fixed, and we can go back to the start of the game. But wait a minute. Yep, Paula cared so much about Mike that, despite only knowing him for a bit of time, she erased the bullets and saved his life. Mike parachutes down into the ocean and is rescued. End of game. Are you alright? You look as if you were staring off in another world. I was thinking about a woman. That's good. It's what you need. That's the best way to cheer you up, you know? Dino Stalker is average at best, below average at worst. It looks fine, sounds okay, can control fine, plays okay enough, and does have a decent amount of content to keep you coming back. However, the movement feels a bit clunky in some instances, the game tends to flip-flop between on and off rails, the game can get repetitive in some areas, especially bosses. It's on the short side, clocking in at about an hour and a half, maybe less if you know exactly what you're doing. The sound mixing isn't great, the voice acting is kinda bad, and it pains me to say this, the Sinden compatibility is not good. I can't really blame that last one on the game itself, but I do wish the designers kept it in mind. Maybe a future revision could remedy this. The game is currently going for about $40 complete in box, and I feel that's too much given what little the game offers. If you use a primary gun con 2 setup with an actual CRT, sure, why not? Sinden only? I can't really recommend you do that. Maybe someone else who has a Sinden had a better experience than me, but I can't say for certain. Really, the best way to play this is PCSX2 with a mouse and keyboard. You might even clear the higher modes there. More, at least. Yeah, I can't say it's the worst Gun Con 2 game since I haven't played all of them, but I do feel like this one leaves a little bit more to be desired uh, in some aspects. Oh well, I give Dino Stalker a 2.5 out of 5. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, click the big red button below to subscribe. Check out the other links in the description for more cool stuff, and check out the playlist on screen for more content. See you in the next video!